good evening everyone uh, first uh, of all good evening I, first of all i would like to thank uh, professor velu rajamani uh, for being part of the webinar series of kchh and uh, for giving the lecture on the topic stating the part of india netherlands relations before we start audience started to uh, kindly keep to keep your microphones on mute uh, uh, during the lecture after the lecture we will have a question and session uh, which usually do in this way type questions into the chat box and we will read it out for the benefit of the uh, speaker and if you still have Uh, some more time you may ask questions directly i request professor michael tarigan to kindly take over the session i think professor tarigan is muted hello can you hear me yes Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Vashya. Uh, I'm extremely happy uh, to chair this um, lecture, being given by. Uh, let me say deliberately, Professor uh, Venu Rajamani, who is on a entirely Uh, new innings in his public career, um, far away from his uh, diplomatic uh, years, which itself was quite exciting and quite uh, 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 useful to the society at large. And he is entering into an entirely new field, where also we expect equally. good results from his um, involvement uh in fact the topic he has chosen of course it was um, uh um, it's on netherlands and india relations after him being uh, ambassador to that country for for a couple of years and more but this is a subject which is worth investigation by both social scientists uh, as well as uh, uh, particularly historians because you know uh, we have um, several tangential uh, routes through which the modern societies of netherlands and, and india has met each other and also there are some bylines in the historical past which also brought this two countries uh, together now of course it was uh, uh, it happened in the context of the expansionist attitude of the late medieval european societies which uh, at one time thought that the whole world can be uh, used for extracting um, so resources for their own uh, development and countries like india um, knowingly or unknowingly were party to that kind of extraction without uh, uh, without demanding any um, counter investment towards their own development but some of the uh, meeting places were very very interesting and i suppose for a historian that would be most interesting um, you see for instance uh, you know almost everybody i suppose in this um, uh, audience would remember the case of delinoy stacey's delinoy i i keep on wondering whether i have ever been able to uh, ever been able to pronounce it right directly <laughs> Uh, i discovered there is a french pronunciation and a flemish pronunciation okay okay and we, we in kerala say delinois which is the flemish 
<laughs> anyway, the, I, 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 I always uh, tell my friends from Holland that the best uh, contribution that they made to the development of my region was this person, Nilin Wai, because he taught us to uh, organize a standing army and also organize modern warfare. I don't know whether that was in the long run really good or bad, but anyway, it helped us to withstand some of the early imbalances that was existing in the power relations between the state of Travancore and, and, and but subsequently, what we find is that, um, of course, uh, there's been a lot of work on what happened during the Dutch period in the west coast of India, particularly southwest coast of India, and its subsequent uh, development. But even afterwards, when the Britishers came to power, uh, there was this Dutch connection, which was off and on, being um, once in a while being uh, being uh, excited being um, uh, incited and that is the uh, uh, subject matter for several uh, case studies and in fact you know i was um, wondering whether um, some of my some of my young historians would spend some time in uh, searching the archives for these kinds of case stories, case histories, which could be of, of tremendous uh, benefit to uh, understanding the complexities as well as the, the, the brightness of the relationship between the two regions. For modern period, I mean, I'm not um, going to say anything about it. First of all, I shouldn't be speaking more because we are all here to listen to Professor Venu Rajamani, who will be, um, of course, the title investigating the rich past of contacts between India and the Netherlands, will be introducing uh, some of these aspects, as well as the, the nature of the relationship, the resilience and uh, other uh, major aspects of this kind of relationship. And I'm sure that all of us would benefit by listening to him. I thank every one of you for taking the trouble to come and listen to this uh, presentation. And I should also thank personally Venu Rajamani. I should thank him not only for giving us the giving us a lecture today, but for several, I'm, I'm not going to uh, give the details, but on several counts, his um, help towards the KCHR uh, uh, was, was, was uh, it was quite, quite um, I, I wouldn't say just helpful, it was quite uh, uh, brilliantly executed with a grace and with a smile, and which always uh, uh, prompted me to thank him by saying that your um, your attitude to the whole question in which he helped us and it was particularly for a uh, uh, academic uh, MOU with their leading uh, the leading Dutch universities the course the Leiden University I I I take this opportunity to once again thank him and um, request him to present his lecture. Dr. Uh, Professor Venu Rajamani. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tarakan. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to speak about the rich past of contacts between India and the Netherlands under the auspices of the Kerala Council for Historical Research. I'm grateful to you, Professor Tarakan, and to all your colleagues in KCHR for having set up this lecture. And I'm particularly happy uh, that I have this opportunity to speak today because uh, what I intend to tell 
is the story of a book I wrote called India and the Netherlands Past, Present and Future, uh, which I think is entirely meant for uh, an audience like that of KCHR for the students and for the scholars of Kerala and of uh, India. Uh, this book was a labor of love and the inspiration for the book began uh, from the time I was told that uh, I'm going to the Netherlands as ambassador. Uh, when I was told I was going to the Netherlands ambas as ambassador, the first thing I did was to look around and see what material there is available in English on the history of India and the Netherlands. And to my surprise and in a way sadness, I found very little comprehensive material available in English that tells the story of contacts between India and the Netherlands in one place. And therefore I thought there is need for such a book. And then proceeding from there, I visited places uh, in India, including in particular in Kerala, uh, which I have a Dutch connection, as well as places in the Netherlands, which have an India connection. And I was pleasantly surprised to find an enormously rich uh, material which provides us opportunity to tell a lot of stories, to do a lot of historical research, uh, and to bring new discoveries uh, to the forefront for the benefit of uh, people all over the world, especially those of Europe and India. I therefore decided to write this book using to the maximum extent art, which is available in the National Museum of the Netherlands, the Rijksmuseum, uh, the records which are available in the national archives. Uh, I was able to even access the royal archives of the Netherlands and whatever material uh, I could source from India uh, for the purpose, but the material was predominantly in the Netherlands. And let me once again uh, inform scholars uh, who are listening uh, that I found the Dutch, both museums and archives, extraordinarily friendly, welcoming, and very willing to support any research project. Uh, to, they were not just willing to support, they were willing to go out of the way and help. So it was a very pleasant experience uh, dealing with and interacting with people who are related to history, related to museums and archives in the Netherlands. This book was published in the Netherlands uh, just before the visit to India by His Majesty King Willem Alexander and Queen Maxima. And I'm very happy, I was very honored that the King himself received the first copy of the book in a grand function at the National Museum, the Rijksmuseum Museum Amsterdam, which was part of a seminar on India-Netherlands relations in which many uh, experts and leading scholars spoke uh, and a large number of ambassadors and dignitaries from every walk of life uh, attended. Since then, the book has received great acclaim within the Netherlands and also uh, in the media in India, whoever has had opportunity to read it uh, and to review it. The book is a labor of love. I'm, I'm not a professional historian. Uh, as Professor Tarek had pointed out, I'm a diplomat who has spent 34 years in the foreign ministry. Uh, I, I studied political science and international relations in Kerala University and in Jawaharlal Nehru University. But history is a passion for me. Uh, it is a passion I think every young person or every, every Indian should have, every world citizen should have. And the book was product of that passion. Uh, I, I, I use pen pictures uh, to tell my stories in the book. And I've tried to make it as easy to read and easy to access as possible so that we can educate a large uh, section of our population in both Europe and here on the wonderful history of this, this relations. Uh, through this, I, I believe that sadly, most of us in India have forgotten, except probably in Kerala, have forgotten our Dutch connections. It is the British connection which overwhelms us when we think of the colonial period and our contacts with the foreign world. And in Europe, their focus is entirely on within themselves in the sense of European Union or the transatlantic relationship. There isn't, except in Britain, there isn't much focus on India. And even in the Netherlands, people tend to see uh, 
Indonesia as their primary colony. Plus one more aspect which, was, which came as a surprise to me was, while we in Kerala and we in India sometimes romanticize our uh, involvement with the Dutch, the, the modern day people in the Netherlands are deeply embarrassed about the history of the East India Company because of all the wrongs that it committed, because of its history of slave trade, because of the exploitation that it engaged in in various parts of the world. I will touch upon that also as part of today's presentation. So going on, so the book was released in uh, Amsterdam at the Rijksmuseum by His Majesty the King. And immediately after that, he came for a visit to India, his first state visit, which also wonderfully included a visit to Kerala. Uh, he came to Kachin. Professor Taragan had an opportunity to interact with him, the Dutch palace. He also visited uh, Kutanad on this occasion. My book is divided into four chapters. Uh, the first chapter uh, deals with the history of the VOC era. The, this is an allegorical representation of the VOC uh, history and journey, which is available uh, in a beautiful art collection in the Rijksmuseum Amsterdam. The second chapter uh, deals with the recent history. Uh, this is a painting of Taj Mahal by the moonlight by one of the greatest painters of uh, modern day Netherlands, Maurice Bauer, who visited India twice. He's the equivalent of the company painters of the British period, but not much is known about him in India. And then there is a chapter uh, on our economic relations, which I call the vibrant present, and a chapter on the small chapter on the future, which I think is very bright for India and the Netherlands. So going on to uh, the, uh, the cover of the book, this uh, picture is what I used as cover for the book. And this is a painting of Cochin from the 17th century by a, cartog by the, a great cartographer and painter known as Johannes Wingbones, who was the cartographer of the uh, Dutch East India Company. What you see right in front of you is his representation of Fort Cochin. And Bingoons lived from 1616 to 1670. And what is special about Bingoons is the fact that uh, he never left the Netherlands. He is known as a voyager on paper. He drew beautiful paintings and very accurate maps, entirely relying on uh, information brought to him by people who sailed to India, people who sailed to various parts of the world. And if you take, I'm just going back a minute, if you take a look at this picture, you will realize that if you sit outside the harbor of Cochin in the waters and look, this is exactly the view that you will see. On the right side, there is Fort Cochin. On the left side, there is uh, Waipin. And in the far uh, background, there is Ernakla. The only unusual piece are the mountains. I do not know. I have not personally gone and sat uh, in the waters outside in recent times, whether you can actually, actually see any mountains or with pollution and um, clouds, whether they are not visible. Maybe this is the Kakanad area near Naklem. But uh, Wengbuns is known for highly accurate paintings of countries across the world. And this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is a, uh, is a pamphlet which was brought out in the Netherlands when Cochin was captured by the Dutch from the Portuguese in the, I think it was in 1628 or so that Cochin fell to the Portuguese. Johannes Wingbuns, I uh, already uh, mentioned, is a voyager on paper, sorry, 1663 is when Cochin was captured by the Portuguese and a special pamphlet was brought out and distributed all over Am uh, Amsterdam saying we have captured Cochin, we have captured Cochin from the Portuguese. So I've already said Johannes Wingboots was the uh, voyager on paper. And this is a picture of Viziapur. Uh, just give me one second to switch on the fan. The power has gone here. My apologies. 
So this is another painting by Johannes Wingbuns from the Rijksmuseum collection of uh, Kanenur or Kanur as we know it. This uh, is uh, the uh, a view of Goa, again by Johannes Wingbuns. This is Viziapur by Johannes Wingbuns. All beautiful paintings drawn based in Netherlands. And this is Rai Bag. All these paintings are available in the Rijksmuseum collection and many of them are also online. The back cover of my book features three drawings by the great master of Dutch painting, Rembrandt. People from all over the world travel to the Netherlands to see the paintings of Rembrandt, particularly the Night Watch. But not many people know that Rembrandt had a Mughal connection. Uh, in his lifetime, during the 17th century, it was the fashion for nobility across Europe and for artists and whoever had the means to collect Mughal miniatures, which was brought back from India by various travelers associated with the East India Company. And Rembrandt possessed a personal collection of miniatures. And not only did he have miniatures, he used them to create sketches of his own including several sketches of Shah Jahan, who was the Mughal emperor of that period. The picture that you see on the left side here is the picture of uh, Shah Jahan, and the other two, as one is a noble and the other is a hunter. The, these paintings, uh, these uh, drawings of Rembrandt inspired by Mughal uh, miniatures are today uh, uh, found across the world, uh, but Netherlands also has some and the Rijksmuseum has a large number of uh, these pictures. A, a scholar of Rembrandt and uh, his passion for miniatures, uh, Stephanie Schrader, in an interview to the Hindu newspaper said, drawn on Asian paper <clears throat> and notable for their nuanced response to the Mughal models, these sheets mark a watershed moment when the Dutch master reacted to the art of a dramatically different culture. Rembrandt was not the only person who was inspired by Mughal miniatures. This is a drawing by another Dutch painter called William Schellings and the Mughal influence, the Mughal theme can be seen all over. William Schellings, who lived from 1627 to 1678, uh, did not also come to India, but he inherited some drawings from his brother who was employed by the VOC. And he not only drew Mughal themes, but he wrote a poem in 1657, singing the praise of Indian art and describing it as knocking off the crown of Europe's head. The lines go, now the ingenious Gujarati shows so beauteously on the page, his paintings more wondrously noble uh, than an artist's brush ever made. And with this, he mocks Europe, knocking from its head art's crown. Thus was art despoiled by art, which artist ever thought that artistry would climb to the peak, to the stars. All Christendom rightly gapes, astonished and struck dumb. I wonder how many uh, people in the world have sung such praise to Indian art. There are a large number of paintings uh, available, and this is one of the special ones of the first Dutch expedition to Asia. Uh, four ships, uh, the names are written there. Uh, all of them traveled, made their first voyage to India in 1595. And one of the, the people instrumental for the success of the Dutch East India Company was a person that, who we see in this picture called Van Linskoten. And Van Linskoten is a fascinating story. He lived from 1562 to 1611. And from the Netherlands, he first went to Portugal, which, had, which was the master of the seas at the time. And he got into employment of, the, of a priest who was being sent to Goa as the Archbishop of Goa. From service to the Archbishop of Goa, slowly he graduated to become secretary to the Portuguese governor of Goa. And in that capacity, he got access to all Portuguese maps and all trade secrets uh, knowledge about the currents and about uh, the oceans. 
All this he put, he came back to the Netherlands and he put together and published in 1595 a book that he called Itinerario. And this book went on to become the handbook for all Dutch sailors, all Dutch uh, uh, captains who sailed to India. And that contained the basic information which opened up the seas to the Dutch. This itinerario is full of fascinating drawings and paintings. And this particular painting is described as the Raja of Kochi and his soldiers in war. Now, uh, we, while the elephant is uh, something very typical of Kerala, and Kochi is clearly our own Kochi, the description of the people at, of the time was once again, or the drawings were made by people sitting in Amsterdam who had never traveled to Kerala and who did not have much idea of how people of Kerala lived or what they dressed or what they wore. So a lot of this was based on second party accounts and third party accounts, and they were exaggerated in a, to a large extent in order to get a readership so that the books would sell, so that the paintings would sell. So this is a painting on, in those, on those vines. Clearly, even in those days, they, they realized that with our tropical weather, there was not much of clothes, but uh, the rest, how much is true, how much is not true, it is for the scholars to decide. And this is another picture also from the itinerario of people belonging to different communities in India. I asked the question in my book, who was the first Dutchman in India? In uh, all the literature related to the East India Company, the name of Dirk, uh, which is a typical Dutch name, uh, who was popularly known as Dirk China, uh, comes up. And he is called Dirk China because he was the first Dutchman to travel to China and to Japan. But before he went to China and Japan, by 1568, at the age of 22, he had already established himself as a merchant in Goa. Um, there is very little information available of, about him and no picture of him could be uh, traced, but in all probability, Dirk China himself was the first Dutchman uh, to come to India to spend time here, start trading. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the original charter of the Dutch East India Company, which was given by the Dutch government in 1602. Uh, this, uh, th there were various, uh, after the travels to India had begun, different provinces, different groups in the Netherlands had created companies to send ships to India. The Dutch government amalgamated all of them and uh, created the Dutch East, or uh, helped create the Dutch East India Company in 1602. And this was the charter which was given to them, which specifically mentions uh, the mandate and the right to travel to India and to trade with India. What is special about the Dutch East India Company is that it's widely regarded as the first multinational corporation in the world, the first public company whose shares were sold in order to raise resources to fund expensive expeditions to Asia, risky expeditions to Asia, the ships could sink and everything could be lost. They devised the stock market was created in Amsterdam and they devised the system of selling shares to rich as well as poor, to nobility as well as common person. And therefore, the Dutch East India Company was an enormous success. This room is the director's room of the East India Company, which is where the directors, there were 11 directors who sat and determined the fortunes of the East India Company across the world. And here, the, the picture, which is on the cover of my book, Kuchin, hangs uh, in this room. Uh, this picture is now in the Rijksmuseum, but a replica is there in this room, which has been preserved. And this room is part of the University of Amsterdam. Some of the departments of University of Amsterdam are today located in the offices of the Dutch East India Company. This is the Dutch East India Company on the left side, office on the left side, today the University of Amsterdam. And on the right side, there's a picture from the 17th century of what the East India Company uh, office used to look like. Ladies and gentlemen, most of you know that the Dutch arrived in Calicut and uh, one of the, the first agreement that the Dutch signed with any ruler in India was with the Zamorin of uh, Calicut, uh, uh, which happened in 1604. Though I hunted all over the National Archives in the Netherlands, 
I could not trace a copy of that 1604 agreement. And I do not know if it is available uh, in any of the archives uh, in India. This is worth exploration. But the National Archives helped me find this agreement, which is signed in 1608, and which has a reference to the 1604 agreement. I was also told by uh, the experts that it is quite possible uh, because at the time India was under Indonesia, a lot of the records were sent to Batavia or today's Jakarta, and maybe in the National Archives of Jakarta, the original uh, agreement of 1604 between the Zamarin and the East India Company can be found. The Dutch were great bookkeepers, so the records are all well preserved. And the National Archives of the Netherlands has done a wonderful job of digitizing them and making it available to the public in every manner possible. This is yet another picture of Johannes Wilbons of the view of Calicut from 1663. This is Canon, uh, which we have already seen. Uh, this is a picture by another painter called Antonison uh, from 1653 of the attack on Portuguese galleons in the Bay of Goa by the Dutch. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a fascinating person known as Baldeus, who was a pastor, a priest who came along with the East India Company. He lived from 1632 to 72. He spent long years in India, in South of India, as well as in Sri Lanka. He learned a number of Indian languages, including Tamil. And this painting is a painting which hangs very prominently in the National Museum in the Netherlands. Baldeus is dressed in uh, some kind of Asian clothes, maybe like a Persian noble with a turban and with uh, uh, something like a saffron robe. And here we see a dark-skinned person by his left side. And uh, scholars have inquired as to who this dark-skinned person is. Uh, you can see a parrot uh, by his side, which symbolizes wisdom. You see a writing stylus uh, by the side of his lunki, which we are all familiar with. He too has a turban, he has earrings, and he has a mustache. And the secret to who he was apparently lies in a notarial document available in the archives of the Hague city, where there is a signature in Tamil saying, Herit Musapatam. Now, Herit is again a typical Dutch name. It was probably given to him. And Musa Patam refers to Masuli Patanam so he, in Tamil Nadu. So he was Herit from Masuli Patanam. It is speculated that he was an interpreter to Baldeus. And Baldeus probably brought him back to the Netherlands from India, making him one of the first Indians in the Netherlands. Today, we have about 250,000 Indians in the Netherlands. The Netherlands has the largest Indian community on mainland Europe. Uh, the second after UK, uh, if we include all of Europe uh, beyond the mainland also. Uh, but uh, Herit Musapatam, we can speculate, we can um, think uh, or assume was the first Indian in the Netherlands. Baldeus was the first person to translate the Lord's Prayer uh, into Tamil. And he wrote a book, uh, the covers on the right side, a description of the East India coast of Malabar and Coromandel in 1672. I look for lots of interesting people who have connected uh, two countries. And in this people, one of in this search, one of the people I found was a person called Virji Vora, whom the British East India Company's factory records described as the richest man in the world at the time, uh, from who lived from 1590 to 1670 in Surat. The Dutch had establishments in Surat, in Malabar, in Coromandel, and in Bengal. And Virji Mora in those days had a net worth of 8 million rupees. He was involved in trading, banking, and money lending, and he would buy entire uh, uh, shiploads which came into Surat, and then he would resell them at a much higher profit. He was rich enough to finance the two East India companies, Dutch East India Company and the British East India Companies, and his uh, downfall ultimately happened when Chhatrapati Shivaji raided and looted Surat in 1664 and 1670. And it is said that uh, Shivaji took away with him six barrels of gold, money, pearls, and gems, and other precious bears belonging to this Virji Vora, the richest man in the world. This is another beautiful painting in the Rijksmuseum collection uh, of the uh, settlement, of the, the Dutch settlement 
in Hubli or the Dutch factory in Hubli, the Dutch like to call their establishments factories. And it is, it is filled with intricate detail and it's filled with activities of all kinds. If you look at it in close, uh, if you go and zoom into it and if you look into it. And Bengal was the richest settlement uh, of the Dutch in India, mainly because Bengal produced a lot of salt, salt uh, pepper, which is used for gunpowder. Uh, the entire revenue from Bengal alone was more than what the Dutch earned from all their establishments anywhere else. This is another painting which is also available uh, in the Rijksmuseum collection. This is on cloth and this describes uh, a Dutchman called Joan Ketelaar who was sent on an embassy to the Mughals and this is the whole entourage with which he traveled to meet the great Mughal kings uh, who were still very powerful and who maintained law and order uh, throughout the realm, enabling the Dutch to travel and to trade and the gifts that he took with him and the kind of reception he got from kingdoms on the way while traveling to Agra where the Mughal emperor sat from Surat. The same Joan Ketelar in 1700 authored what is believed to be the first Hindustani grammar and this book is today in the collection of the Utrecht University Library. I've already mentioned, ladies and gentlemen, that the, there was a uh, hobby and a passion to collect Mughal miniatures. Uh, and the Rex Museum Amsterdam has a large collection of uh, 17th century Mughal miniatures. And these are some of the samples of the collections which are available with them. Uh, this is another set of samples, which include Shivaji and Raja Mansi, etc. Uh, and the Rex Museum also has in its collection what is known as the the blouse, uh, where uh, there is a father and son team who manufactured, who created some of the greatest atlases of the world, what was considered the most valuable, most expensive books at the time. Chins uh, deserves a special place in the history of India and I will just go back for a second. Uh, chins refers to cotton printed cloth from India. And during the 17th century, large amount of these cloth would come to the Netherlands. The Netherlands was not as rich as the French or other empires where silk from China would be used. So they opted for cotton and printed cotton and these uh, chintz pieces soon became the rage of uh, uh, the rich and the nobility in uh, Netherlands. Initially, it started with clothes worn by the servants and undergarments, then it went on to become fashionable clothes. And there are some villages in India where in the Netherlands, where even today, chintz is worn as their traditional dress on special occasions. And there are museums which have a large collection of chintz from India, uh, stored in their uh, go-downs. No recounting of uh, India-Netherlands relations can avoid or leave out the Hortus Malabaricus, which I believe is one of the greatest contributions of Indo-Dutch cooperation from the 17th century. This is the cover of the Hortus Malabaricus, uh, which was published in Amsterdam in the mid-17th century in 12 volumes, all in Latin. It provided information regarding 742 medicinal plants the, every uh, description of a plant and its medicinal properties were accompanied by beautiful drawings like these. The names were written in Latin, in Malayalam, in Arabic, and in Konkani. And this is considered the first book where Malayalam appeared in print. I show some more of these pictures from the Otis Malabaricus. Uh, the Professor Manilal of Calicut University translated the Latin into English and then into Malayalam. The Kerala University has published this. Uh, and this is a great treasure of knowledge, which sadly, even today, most people, including people from the Ayurveda fraternity who should know about it, are unaware. And the people in the Netherlands are less aware of it. I had great I had opportunity to organize seminars and discussions uh, around the theme of the Hortus Milibaricus and uh, Ayurveda during my stay in the Netherlands. So these again are some pictures from the Hotus Malabaricus. And this is Itti Achudan uh, Vaidyan. Uh, this is from uh, the Malabar Botanical Garden in Purikur. It's a imaginary representation, but 
uh, the certificate in Malayalam which he has signed, which is included in the Hotus Malabaricus, is reproduced here, which says that uh, all the contents have been examined and that the knowledge there is correct. It was the knowledge of Vityachudan. And it is it, it, interesting that in this exercise, unlike other colonial enterprises, the knowledge was not appropriated and all credit taken to the colonial masters. Instead, it was due credit was given to Itti Achudan and to all the people, a multinational, multilingual team worked to bring together the information in the Hotus Malabarikas. But of course, credit goes to Von Raider, who was the Dutch commander who uh, ordered the initiation of this exercise and who ensured that he got it published in Amsterdam, but still uh, enough for uh, sufficient credit is given to the Indian and other actors in this enterprise. Here we have Hendrik Adrian von Raider. He was a soldier, he was a statesman, he was a botanist. He had great love for plants and animals. He took back large number of plants and animals from uh, India. We uh, in uh, Kerala know him as uh, the commander in Cochin and the creator of the person who ordered the compilation of the Hotus Malabaricus. But he's, uh, uh, he went back to the Netherlands from Cochin and then again he was sent back by the East India Company to investigate certain cases of corruption in Surat. And he died and there is a mausoleum in his honor in Surat. He died traveling from Mumbai to Surat in India. It is believed that because he was investigating cases of corruption, that some of his rivals themselves uh, would have poisoned him. Uh, and that is the reason of his death. So these are all, I think, material for much greater research. And this is a painting from the Rijksmuseum Amsterdam of the funeral procession of uh, Hendrik Adrian von Raider, which would have been, uh, I, I don't know if it is in Zurich or in uh, back in the Netherlands, but the size and scale and the number of people who participated in the funeral procession reflected his prestige and his status. Obviously, this because uh, it, they are taking him for burial in that mausoleum, it would have happened in uh, uh, India and so on. Uh, another fascinating character who has linked our two countries together is known as William uh, Hafner. Uh, he was one of the greatest travel writers in Dutch history of the 17th century. And what is interesting about him is that he writes about falling in love with an Indian dancing girl, Devadasi, whom he called Mamia, and whom he drew in his books. He met his book of uh, travel accounts is called Traveling Across India in a Palanquin. We see him coming out of a palanquin uh, on the banks of a temple tank. And it is here when she was coming out after a bath that he first uh, met Mamia. Uh, the story goes that uh, he was, uh, Mamia died saving his life uh, when a boat overturned and war hit her chest. And uh, after he cremated her, he, he was so heartbroken that he couldn't live in India anymore. And he went back to the Netherlands. The house where he lived can still be found in Amsterdam. Uh, what is interesting about Hafner is not just his love story and his travel writings, but also his revolutionary views. Uh, he was asked to write an essay on the contributions of Christian missionaries in the colonial enterprise. And he said Christian missionaries should leave the people of the colonies alone. There's nothing wrong with their religion. They should rather try to Christianize the Europeans who come to uh, the colonies and inflict tremendous harm on the local people. So he was one of the earliest people to write a strong language in defense of the people of the colonies. Uh, he wrote, I consider all people of whatever color, nation and religion they may be, as my fellows and brothers, anyone who thinks about it as much as I will, not be annoyed by this, but rather enjoy seeing that I defend and represent the innocent and oppressed Indians and try to overload their tyrants with disgrace. This, uh, these pictures represent another fascinating person called Ram Singh Malam, who came from Bhuj in Gujarat. Uh, Malam was shipwrecked off the coast of Africa and picked up by a passing East India Company ship and taken to Europe. He spent 18 years in Europe, during which he learned the arts of Europe. He learned the arts of glass making in Netherlands, perhaps even in Venice. And then he returned to India 
And the Raja of Bhuj asked him to create an Aina Mahal for the Raja. And that Aina Mahal uh, exists even today in the Bhuj Palace, which is a museum. And these are pictures from the Aina Mahal. Professor Tarakan spoke about Eustachius Delanoi. And uh, here we see uh, the church in Udegiri Fort, where Delanoi, his wife, and his son are buried. Uh, the steep, the front of the uh, church is very typically in Dutch style, though on the two sides we see conch shell representing Travancore. These are the graves uh, in which Delanoi and his wife and his son are buried. Because it is uh, in Tamil Nadu, not in Kerala, uh, I think uh, it is not maintained uh, as well as it should be. So there is need for the Kerala and Tamil Nadu governments to work together to create, uh, to turn this into a wonderful little museum with a lot of storytelling of the history of uh, Delanoi. And uh, the epitaph in the, the Giri Fort, when he was buried, said, uh, stop Wayfarer, here lies Eustachius Benedictus Delanoi who was General-in-Chief of the Troops of Travancore, come in 37 years, he served the King of uh, Travancore, uh, first Martan Varma and then Dharmaraja. Uh, he subjected uh, to the King's way all the kingdoms from Kaingulam to Kuchin. He lived 62 years and five months and died on the 1st June, 1777. Uh, sadly, there is very little information available on Illinois. There is only one, one of his descendants, Mark Lenoy, who has written a book, not in particularly about him, but about Trampo history, where he refers to it, but no detailed uh, uh, study. I have wondered, did he not write letters back to his family? Did he not travel to Netherlands and come back during all the period that he spent in Trampo? Uh, did he, are there no other records which are available, no other studies which would uh, cast more light on his uh, life? Uh, I think all this uh, requests to be explored further, both in the Netherlands as well as uh, here in India. But uh, what I discovered new, which I did not know is, uh, there were, like Delanoi, there were a large number of uh, Dutch soldiers who came to India. And then uh, as the Dutch East India Company declined, went into the service of uh, the Maharajas of India. And this is a mausoleum in Agra, known as the Red Taj, Red because of red sandstone and Taj because of the similarity to the Taj Mahal. And uh, this is built by, uh, built by the wife and daughter of a person called Jan Willem Hessing from Utrecht in the Netherlands, who was the commander of the Agra fort under the Maharaja of Sindhya for long years and also died in India. This is a picture of Trangenur by another artist, uh, Dutch artist, Jan Brandes, also from the uh, Dutch Museum from the Rijksmuseum. And this, uh, I think, are familiar pictures for uh, most people. Uh, this is the St. Francis Church in Cochin, uh, Fort Kutipuram, the Palium Palace, the Bulgati Palace, all of which are considered, uh, all of which have a strong Dutch connection, fusions of uh, Indo Dutch uh, architecture. But this is lesser known. This is the Krishna Temple in Mabilikara. And the brass lamp is of particular importance in the front. At the bottom of the brass lamp are four soldiers, believed to be Dutch soldiers, dressed in European style uh, with muskets of the kind that was used in those days in their hands and uh, barefooted. I was initially, uh, I, there was, I read that it was uh, a lamp which was gifted to the temple and to the Maharaja to mark the Treaty of Mavilikara between Martandorma and the Dutch East India Company, but subsequently uh, other people have given other stories as to how uh, the lamp came here and that it was soldiers uh, who probably belonged to one of the battalions of Eustachius Delanoi who gifted this lamp to the temple. This is the famous bell in uh, Varkala Temple, which was gifted by the Dutch. It is believed that uh, a ship uh, suffer is, escaped a storm near Varkala. And in gratitude, the Dutch captain gifted the bell to the temple. And these are the mural paintings which we find in the Dutch palace in Matanjiri, extraordinarily beautiful. I give a sample here. Uh, the Jewish community of Cochin were great allies of the Dutch because the Portuguese had tried to convert them and to impose religion. 
And after that, the Dutch were agnostic when it came to religion. They were Protestants. They were not interested in conversion. So the Jews became their allies and their partners as traders, as diplomats. And uh, the leaders of the Jewish community had great status with the Dutch East India Company. They also had lots of contacts with the Jewish community in Amsterdam, which was a flourishing community. And Amsterdam was a center of learning and publishing at that time. So the Jewish community would send uh, scriptures and other religious texts to Cochin from Amsterdam. And they sent a delegation led by Mose Pereira the Paiva to come and study the situation of the Jews in Cochin. The report that they submitted is considered one of the most authentic records of the life of Jews in Cochin of that period. And this report is available in uh, the Free University Library in Amsterdam. And uh, interestingly, the Dutch commander in Cochin sent a painting of the leader of the Jewish community, somebody known as Ezekiel Rahabi, merchant and diplomat, back to the Netherlands, which is available in the Middleburg Museum. This is the Victory Monument uh, of Kolechel uh, and a bed from the Patnavaram Palace. Once again, the, Kolechel, the Battle of Kolechel is something we in Kerala uh, make much about, but the Dutch hardly are aware of it. Uh, it is not, not something that registered very strongly on their uh, consciousness as an important uh, historical event. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is something uh, which I discovered in one of the Kuchi Art Biennales. A South African artist called Sue Willemson uh, created this installation art uh, to remember slaves who were taken from Cochin to South Africa by the Dutch. Uh, she, she found in the Cape Town castle of, of South Africa, detailed records of every single slave who was taken from Kuchin, including their age and the price at which they were purchased. Some of them were children. Uh, and she thought uh, she uh, took cloth of the kind slaves would have worn in those days. She printed their name and details on them. She mixed it with the soil of the Cape Town castle, brought it to Kuchin, there's a Dutch laundry which still exists in Fort Putin. She washed it uh, in the Dutch laundry in a symbolic reenactment of the washing away of the dirt of history. And then she hung it out to dry. So this beautiful installation art, which I saw at Puchi Biennale, uh, persuaded me to investigate more about the history of slavery uh, in which the Dutch East India Company was engaged in, which is not much known and I discovered that from the Dutch used to take slaves to other continents and other establishments they had in foreign countries so that the slaves wouldn't run away. Uh, Burma and Bengal were the main sources from which they took uh, the slaves uh, but from Kerala also there were a number of slaves who were taken. This is uh, uh, Peter Kuhn uh, who uh, was a command a great general of the Dutch East India Company. He is known as the butcher of Banda for uh, the, the massacre which he committed on the island of Banda, which was known for its nutmeg, so that uh, the local people will never compete against uh, the Dutch. There is a statue uh, in his honor in a town called Huren. And we have all known about uh, the pulling down of statues in Britain and America in the context of the Me Too movement in the Netherlands too long back. Uh, there was a demand that it pulled down. And the Dutch used a very interesting way of deciding what to do with the statue. By the side of the statue, you see the West Fries Museum, which is the museum of the town. And there they held a public referendum. And they invited people to come and argue in favor of keeping the statue or pulling down that statue. And uh, ultimately, by a majority vote, they decided that the statue will stay, but a plaque, which you can see, will remain which tells about all the horrible things that he did. So rather than pull down his statue, though he was a bad man, you keep a statue and you use it to educate people of the wrongs which were committed during the colonial period. This is a very uh, rare and precious document which I got from the Royal Archives of the Netherlands. Um, it is a letter written in Dutch and Malayalam by the King of Cochin Shaptan Tampurat in 1790 to the Dutch stadtholder Willem V requesting him to send warships and men to protect Puchan from the incursions of Tipu Sultan of uh, Mysore. This, uh, friends, is uh, two documents from the archives. 
One is the Q letters written by Willem V in 1795 to various Dutch governors, asking them to hand over Dutch possessions to the British. This was following the invasion of the Netherlands and occupation of the Netherlands by the French. Uh, there are references to Coromandel and Puchin in this uh, document. And the other is the Anglo-Dutch Treaty of 1824, ceding all Dutch establishments in India to the British in, in exchange for Sumatra and Bankulan near the Ma Malacca Straits. So with 1824 is when the Dutch and the British agreed that the Dutch will leave India, they will focus on Southeast Asia, mainly Indonesia, and the British will uh, take over lordship over India. So now I'll go faster. I see we are reaching one hour. We already saw this picture of Morris, Maurice Bauer, who visited India twice, the equivalent of uh, the company paintings of the British period. And this is another painting uh, of evening uh, by the, by, in Banaras, Fakirs by the river Ganges. Uh, the largest component of the Indian community in the Netherlands are what is known as Suriname Hindustanis, people who are descendants of uh, those taken from UP and Bihar through an agreement signed between the British and the Dutch uh, following the abolition of slavery in Suriname. Suriname was a Dutch colony. Uh, so these people were taken 150 years back by ship from Calcutta to work on the plantations. They settled down there permanently. Their descendants got Dutch citizenship. Some, many of them, even today, the majority population in Suriname is of Indian origin, but uh, almost half the Indian community there migrated to the Netherlands and is now uh, the largest component of the Indian community. And this is the agreement signed between the British and the Dutch by which uh, these people were taken to Surinam. There were a large number of scholars. Uh, Netherlands has a great tradition of Indology. Hendrik Kern, whom you see on the left side, was the first chair in Sanskrit in Leiden University. In 1865, the chair was established. In the middle, you have Sean Philip Vogel, who was uh, head of the Archaeological Survey of India, who worked from 1901 to 1914. And uh, on the right side, you see Manan, who was a great Tibet theosophist and Tibetologist, who went on to serve for long years as secretary of the Royal Asiatic Society of Bengal. Uh, I reproduce the obituary, which was published in the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society of Bengal, uh, which says that uh, he was a bohemian during his young period. For most of his life, he was a bohemian, but uh, uh, he's with, it is from India that he discovered a fountain of uh, mystic philosophy, ancient religions, wisdom, and mysteries. And he learned uh, many great languages, including Tibetan and, of course, the lost theosophy as a philosophy. Uh, many Indian spiritual leaders, there's a spiritual connection between India and the Netherlands. Swami Vivekananda visited the Netherlands. Uh, immediately on coming back from the Conference on World Religions in Chicago, he visited the Rijks Museum. Tago visited the Netherlands to great acclaim. And Jiddu Krishnamurti and Nani Besant were regular visitors to the Netherlands. Uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti's Order of the Star in the East was founded in the Netherlands. And it is a castle was gifted to him by a baron where every year there would be gatherings of people from all over the world, uh, in some years going up to 25,000 people. And it is here that Jiddu Krishnamurti announced uh, that he was not a messiah, he was an ordinary person, and that he would like to disband the order of the Star of the East. Uh, Sufi Hasrat Inayat Khan, who founded the Universal Sufi Order, and uh, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, are uh, two other people who have connected India and the Netherlands. So is the great artist Mondria of modern times, who was a theosophist. Uh, this is a picture of a fibula, which was discovered in the 50s during excavation in the Friesland province. Uh, about 10 years back, they sent it for carbon testing and they discovered that the red stone in it is a red garnet from Rajasthan, which probably signifies that through uh, various forms of uh, second party and third party trade, goods from India would have reached uh, Netherlands even in the seventh century. These are some of the manuscripts in the collection of the Leiden University. They have Pali, they have Sanskrit manuscripts, but they have Tamil manuscripts. These are some Sanskrit palm leaf manuscripts in the Grantha script commonly used for Malayalam. You can see that it looks almost identical to Malayalam. Uh, these are Chola, 
uh, copper plates, which are uh, there in the collection of the Leiden University. And this is an interesting story of Clara, the rhinoceros, which belonged to uh, the VOC head in uh, Bengal, Sikhtaman. Uh, it was taken back to Europe and it became a star in Europe. It was taken across Europe with uh, princes and nobility and royalty visiting the rhinoceros to see the rhinoceros. It was one of the first rhinoceroses in Europe and a large number of artists have captured it in painting. But equally in 1954, uh, uh, a child in the Netherlands, an eight-year-old girl wrote to uh, Prime Minister Nehru saying, we children of the Netherlands have never seen an elephant. And India gifted the children of the Netherlands, Murugan, an elephant from Malabar, which lived in the Amsterdam Zoo for 50 years. This is the children uh, receiving Murugan on arrival in Amsterdam. Uh, Netherlands finds special mention in the glimpses of world history of uh, Nehru. He described this it as a republic forged through sacrifice and suffering. And uh, this, uh, when Nehru visited uh, the Netherlands in 1957, the Dutch prime minister uh, said, uh, in comparison to India, the Netherlands is just a handkerchief. And Nehru's response was very interesting because he said, uh, you, you compare the Netherlands to India in size, but a country's greatness does not lie in its size or the number of its people, but in some inner quality which that country possesses. Uh, your country has made itself felt for hundreds of years uh, by its labor, by its intelligence, by its ingenuity, building up this very country out of the swamps of the sea. Few countries exhibit so much of this man's labor as Holland does. Uh, the royalty of the Netherlands has had a long connection with India, and this is Princess Beatrice, uh, Crown Princess Beatrice then, who later became Queen Beatrice, during a visit to India in the 60s on the Ganges. Uh, she also visited Indira Gandhi and Nehru in uh, Delhi in 62. And this is one of her subsequent visits in uh, Rajasthan. And this is the current King William Alexander as a young crown prince, along with his father, Prince Klaus, who was also a great friend of India, meeting President Vikramin. And this is an interesting story of how the Dutch uh, mediated. Uh, they got word from uh, Rajiv Gandhi when he passed through the Netherlands. Uh, uh, and, and Rajiv Gandhi had come from Moscow. So he carried a message from the um, Russian leadership to the Dutch uh, prime minister at the time. Uh, there, that was a time when uh, the NATO was to put nuclear missiles in the Netherlands and there was great public protests uh, against those nuclear missiles. So uh, the Russians told the Dutch, uh, don't agree to this. Uh, and uh, we are soon going to reach an agreement with the Americans on detente. Uh, and the Dutch listened to it, and uh, the Prime Minister was able to satisfy the public protest, the peace demonstrators, uh, by saying no to the nuclear weapons of NATO. This is uh, the current Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, from a scene in the Dutch Ambassador's House in Delhi. This is when Prime Minister Modi came to the Netherlands on cycles. The Dutch are known for their cycles. These are pictures of the Dutch companies who have been in India. Uh, the oldest companies are Philips from the 30s, uh, Shell also from the 30s, and Unilever, uh, which is uh, most people in India consider it as an Indian company, but it provides almost 30% of uh, uh, the total global revenue uh, of the uh, Unilever Global is from India. And the largest Indian company in the Netherlands is Tata Consultancy Services. It sponsors the Amsterdam Marathon every year. Uh, Tata Steel has a major presence in the Netherlands. And these are some scenes of the Rijksmuseum Amsterdam, uh, people doing yoga on Yoga Day in front. Uh, this is from the Dam Square, which is the heart of Amsterdam, again on Yoga Day. That is the Royal Palace in front. Hague is known as the City of Peace and Justice. We used to organize annual Gandhi marches from the Peace Palace in The Hague uh, to the City Hall. Uh, this is a scene from that. Again, people of the Netherlands, the Indian community marching for peace and violence. And this is the newer uh, on the Dam Square, uh, uh, one of the oldest and most beautiful churches, which is today a place for exhibitions. And they had a wonderful exhibition called We Have a Dream, Gandhi, King and Mandela, for which uh, they got one charka 
from Sabarmati Ashram, actually used by Mahatma Gandhi and built an entire story about Gandhi, his achievements, his life, using just one important item as exhibit. And the Sabarmati Ashram also gave them as a special gesture, a bicycle used uh, by Mahatma Gandhi, which was also used uh, very usefully by them. This is the Dutch king and queen you know, on arrival in Kerala. Uh, this again is a scene from Kerala with the Dutch queen in a green sari. I conclude my presentation with this. Thank you so much for having listened with uh, great patience. And I hope I have not overshot the time too much, Professor Tarakan. Thank you, Professor Tarakan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Pashia, uh, who will be moderating uh, the question and answer yeah. session? Yeah, sir, I will moderate the session. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Rajamani, uh, for the presentation. Uh, as mentioned earlier, now we have the question session. Uh, already we have some questions in the chat box. Uh, uh, there is a suggestion by Vedavyasan that there is also a VOC bell in the Kodanalu temple. Said to have been gifted by the Dutch. And, and uh, yeah, it is suggested by where the Vyas is. And another one of the query by Bangladesh Babu why VOC declined? Internal political turmoil of Netherlands or decline in Indo Dutch trade or rise of British Raj? Well, I think, um, uh, once again, sometimes it uh, hurts me and pains me to see people being simplistic and saying, because of the Battle of Kolichal, uh, the East India Company declined and the Dutch were chased out of uh, India and Kerala. Uh, there's a long sequence of events beginning from, to my understanding, beginning from uh, the Battle of Plassey, the growing uh, dominance uh, of the uh, British uh, in India, the growing power of the British in India, the Anglo-French wars in which the French were defeated and the French ceased to be a major trading power in uh, India with the Dutch, uh, uh, with the competition mainly becoming between the Dutch uh, and the British and the British being far more powerful. Uh, and also uh, Napoleon's invasion of Netherlands, uh, which we briefly saw in the presentation, which forced the Dutch king to flee to Britain uh, and to take refuge in Britain. And sitting in Britain, he wrote, uh, he was afraid that the French would uh, use the opportunity to uh, take over the positions of the Dutch. So he virtually told every Dutch commander to hand over their positions to the British commanders uh, for safekeeping. So a series of events, along with in Kerala, of course, the Battle of Kolichal and the rise of Martha Navarma uh, also plays a role in this. Professor Tarakan, something else you can add to this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 I would also like to add uh, that 18th century uh, was a period when there was both uh, from under Anirindirinal Martanda Varma as well as uh, under Tipu Sultan. There were two very powerful centralizing forces, one from the north and one from the south. And uh, literally, the Dutch got in between. Uh, and uh, uh, they didn't have the uh, ability to, to withstand the internal pressures that the, the three, two so-called pareotops created. And what is interesting is that, the, uh, since your theme is about the Dutch uh, uh, Indian relationships, I got a feeling that, you know, that story is yet to be told. Uh, Martanda Verma learned from the Dutch how to build a centralized state and that it requires a centralized army and tax collection and trade and all that. And he used the same methods to uh, sabotage the Dutch dominance, of course, in alliance with the, with the British. And I think that... Uh, that should also be added probably to the, to the Of course, what you said is very, very correct and I'm not, I'm not uh, <coughs> discarding it and only adding to it. Thank you. Uh, next question by 
Chris Joby. Uh, you referred to Baldio's interpreter Gerrit. What evidence do we have about how interpreters learned Dutch? And did other Dutch learn Indian languages? I, I, I mentioned right at the beginning that Baldeus himself was a scholar of many Indian languages, including Sanskrit uh, and Malayalam. And there are a large number of uh, Dutch people who came and lived long years in India and learned language. Like there was uh, Joan Kettler, who authored a book uh, on Hindustani grammar. So a number of Dutch came here and learned uh, languages. And uh, the, I, I mean, the, the evidence that Herit, uh, there is no direct evidence that Herit uh, was a uh, expert in Dutch language or that he is an interpreter, but it is speculated because he is seen with Beldeus in a very prominent painting of the 17th century. Clearly, he was a man of importance and he was closely associated with uh, Beldeus. And because you find that uh, notarial document with a signature in Tamil uh, in the city of The Hague, so Herit had to come to uh, the Netherlands to sign that and he would have lived in the Netherlands for a period of time. So his close association with uh, Baldeus would have enabled him to also learn Dutch uh, and uh, he was also helping Baldeus learn uh, Tamil and various other Indian languages. So the stylus on his hip in the lungi is what is supposed to signify. Uh, the fact that uh, he was a, a scholar or he was a person who, who used to write well uh, and therefore he was carrying the stylus along. And the parrot by the side is the symbol of this. Uh, the permission of uh, uh, Pashia, I would also uh, add that in the early 17th century, uh, there was a Dutch school in, in Kote, Kote. Uh, yes, that yes. was recently uh, worked on and uh, it was in, published. Correct. In fact, after the, yeah, after the book came out, a large number of people have brought to my attention more elements uh, of Dutch connections, which uh, clearly in the book had to be choosy, otherwise it would have become uh, huge uh, as to what I put in. But uh, the school in Kote is certainly very important. We heard about the bell in Kodinglo. A lot of people have asked me uh, whether, like in um, uh, English, Indian words have gone into Dutch. We know of the Dutch words in Indian language. Uh, so what was the Dutch pollination? Similarly, food. There was a lot of uh, coming and going in food kitchen. Even there is supposed to be bread, uh, Dutch bread, which is manufactured by certain families. Uh, there is supposed to be a Facebook group which says uh, the uh, descendants of Dutch people in Fort Cochin. We use Anglo-Indians as an omnibus term, but there are descendants of the Portuguese, descendants of the Dutch, uh, descendants of the British uh, in India. So there, there still is a great deal which needs to be discovered, recorded and written about and studied. Another question by Rajesh Pia. If a question is put by a foreigner so as to who were best of Kerala, best for Kerala, whether it is Portuguese, Dutch, or British, whom Kerala is like. Of them, you get this question to tour guides of Kochi. Who do you answer? Is it? Well, uh, I, I think the the correct and honest answer has to be that the colonial enterprise was wrong. Uh, and in that sense, uh, there is no way uh, we in India or Kerala can justify colonialism as correct. But amongst the people who came, there were a lot of uh, good people who, but they were also, of course, conditioned by the times, but still they took an interest in India. They took an interest in our religion, our culture, our languages. They recorded all this. They created art. They made friends with the Indians. They transferred a lot of knowledge from there. People like Eustatius Delanoy served uh, Maharaja Martandwarma, Yan Willem Hessing served Maharaja Sindhya. So uh, the, the, it, it is not a universally black story. There is a big black part, which also has not been studied and recorded adequately enough. Like the, I, I don't know if anybody has worked on the history of slave trade from Kerala, especially uh, by the Dutch. So we need to go into all those in much greater detail. But there are also good people and positive sides 
to that whole uh, colonial interchange. Uh, if I may add a sentence here, uh, Professor Sanal Mohan, who was our former director, is uh, <clears throat> heading a project on Indonesian, uh, Indian Ocean uh, slave trade, in which, of course, the connections be between the South, South African uh, economy drawing large number of slaves from the Kerala, Kerala region. And the work is, is already already started and and uh, you know, I presume when it is finished, it will uh, end up in solid uh, volumes, which will add to our understanding of the processes. The, the, the Rijksmuseum Amsterdam uh, was planning, I don't know if COVID has changed their plans, but they were planning a year long um, series of uh, exhibits and uh, exhibitions to mark uh, slavery and to bring out the story of slavery by the East India Company in full. And a lot of, uh, I, I attended an exhibition on uh, Suriname uh, in the Rex Museum Amsterdam, where the mayor of Amsterdam came and publicly apologized for uh, the cruelties that have been inflicted on the people of Suriname by the Dutch. And Suriname as a colony was part owned by the city of Amsterdam. And today the mayor of Amsterdam is a, a socialist, is a liberal, and she felt that she had moral responsibility and she should publicly apologize on behalf of the city of Amsterdam for the crimes committed by their ancestors. Thank you, sir. One more question by Rajesh Pia. Does Hothos Malabarkas help in Ayurveda? Well, uh, I, I, people, uh, Ayurveda scholars do not directly use uh, the Hothos Malabarkas to my knowledge, but the, no the knowledge contained in that would be of tremendous benefit to anybody who is a practitioner of traditional medicine and anybody who studies traditional medicine has this ready-made information available on the properties of medicinal plants. The only problem which I understand is I'm told that out of the 742 plants uh, which are recorded in the Hotus Malabaricus, when the Malabar uh, garden was created, uh, Mr. Benoy Vishwam was the environment minister and he wanted all these plants to be brought back and uh, planted there, but uh, they, they, could, they could only find about 200 plants. The remaining uh, plants mentioned in Hortum Malabaricus are yet to be identified and to be cultivated in a systematic manner. But would that information be correct, Professor Taraka? Uh, sorry, you are muted. Uh, yeah, what I also understand this exactly the same thing. Uh, I do not find uh, 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 Ayurvedic research going into the, the, the plants and their uh, uh, medical, medical abilities uh, so much um, as, you know, the, the, they don't find much mention in the Ayurveda textbooks, for instance or even in the, in the practices that is um, normally that we know of. Uh, I, I may be wrong, but you know, I think uh, there's a great possibility of uh, making use of this knowledge uh, also to strengthen the Ayurveda approach to, to, to medical care. I, mean, that, that, that's a I had occasion to show this uh, uh, and to bring to the attention of the Minister for Ayush and a delegation which had come to the Netherlands from Delhi. Uh, and none of them, of course, were unaware. But they were all very excited because ultimately, if Ayurveda has to establish itself in competition with medicine, and uh, if they have to try and scientifically prove that uh, Ayurveda treatment and Ayurveda cures the medicines work, uh, they need to also know the scientific properties of uh, each of the medicines that they use, each of the plants that they use, and then translate it into language which is acceptable by the rest of the medical community. So for that, to, an, to some extent, uh, publication uh, or the, the 12 volumes of the Hortus Malabaris can also help. 
because it is the beginnings of that exercise. Uh, next is uh, another question by Vengadesh Babu. Why more Bengalis were taken as slaves by Dutch when Malabar is much closer and shorter in distance? I guess it was uh, probably just because Bengal was a much bigger settlement. I had mentioned that it is the richest settlement uh, and their activities were more widespread. But I don't know enough of the history of uh, slave trade. Uh, to know why they focused on. Traditionally, it was believed in India that most of the slaves came from Bengal or from the Arakans. But the discovery of slavery from Cochin is a more recent, or from Kerala and Malabar is a more uh, recent phenomenon. But perhaps Professor Saral Mohan's research will throw more light on all these questions. Thank you, sir. Uh... Uh, I think we have come to the end of the session as there are no, no more questions in the chat box. If there are any last minute questions, kindly use the uh, raise hand option. I would like to ask a, a kind of a question or a, or a point. Uh, uh, Professor Rajamani, I, I find that one a uh, potential aspect of the Indo-Dutch uh, relations is the 1960s and the beginning of 1970s, when there was this big uh, flower child movement, the flower children of the of the of the European rich European societies, particularly the Dutch society, found so seeking solace and and peace uh, came all the way to the Himalayas and, and also uh, Maharishi, uh, Mahesh Yogi and, and, and there was this, um, that was particularly led by the Dutch. I mean, that's what I understand. Uh, now, uh, I wonder whether, you know, there's been any kind of specific studies made on this in, 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 in Holland? Because in English, I find that hardly anything has been uh, written on this. But people talk about it, especially uh, my friends from different parts of, of, of uh, uh, Netherlands. They, they all admit that this was a big, big movement. And, and a lot of knowledge about India, uh, about Indian handicrafts, Indian dresses, Indian beads and and garlands and all that uh, spread in, in 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 Holland as a result of this. This uh, I was right. wondering whether you have any. No, 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 I haven't come across any particular study. Uh, I think, and there's no prominent uh, individual who came uh, and uh, because of that uh, it got recorded or it got the attention of others. We all know about the Beatles who came to uh, meet Marshi Mahesh Yogi and uh, became their disciples. And the Marshi himself, after initially living in Switzerland, shifted to Netherlands for the last 18 years of his life. So he died in the Netherlands and he has created a huge wooden palace which still exists and which functions as the headquarters of the Marshi European Research University. Uh, this okay. is in the province of the Netherlands on the border of uh, Germany. So a lot of the, his British disciples and disciples from all over the world would come uh, to the Netherlands to meet him and to spend time with him when he was living. And uh, the universal Sufi order, Hazrat Inayat Khan, who mentioned, I was surprised I had not heard much of Sufism in Europe, uh, but uh, a very prominent individual who passed away a few years back, uh, uh, he was a former deputy prime minister of Netherlands, former finance minister of the Netherlands, managing director of IMF, and he was a Sufi, a practicing Sufi, and he was the leader of the Sufi faith in the Netherlands. And uh, uh, there is a, a particular spot uh, on the, what they call the dunes by the side of the beach in the town of Katwijk, uh, which uh, is called Murad Hassel, because Inayat Khan came there, sat in meditation, and that is where he had his awakening. Uh, and that is where they built uh, the, temp the Sufi temple. 
Sir, uh, Chris Joby has raised his hand. Now, Chris Joby, uh, hello, Chris Joby, you may ask the hello. question. Thank you very much. Sorry, yes, just a quick follow up on the one I put in the, the chat. Um, I, I've written a book on um, the Dutch language in Japan. And one of the interesting things there is that interpreters, Japanese interpreters were trained, um, not always with great success, um, to you know, interpret between the Dutch and the Japanese. Um, so I'm just wondering, I, you mentioned the example of Kherit, maybe he wasn't interpreted, maybe he wasn't, but is there any more evidence of a more general attempt to train interpreters to act as intermediaries between the Dutch and the Indians that they encountered? Or did communication just take place more directly? I'm just curious about how they communicated, basically. I think perhaps the school in Kotem that we refer to mm. was the institutional effort to train Indians in not just Dutch, but also other European uh, languages. Uh, but clearly the traders came uh, and they communicated and they were uh, intermediaries. <laughs> the, Jewish, uh, the Jewish community was a very important uh, intermediary between the Dutch and the uh, local people. And since they themselves were traders and they were uh, great travelers, uh, maybe they learned uh, language fast much more, but no, no, no other evidence other than individuals having studied on their own and learned the language. Sure, sure, yeah. And as you say, the the Jewish connection would be an interesting one to pursue. To what extent they were operating as linguistic intermediaries as well as commercial ones. Armenians, I think, did something similar in the Persian Empire. So, thank you very much. Fascinating talk. Uh, Mr. Shaji, Mr. Shaji has raised his hand. Excuse me. Hello. Uh, Hello. You are not audible, Mr. Yes. Shaji. Yes. Hello. 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 Uh, uh, no, it's not clear. It's not clear. Maybe uh, you should use it. Yeah, he has given a message saying that, uh, sorry, no question. <laughs> uh, I, I think so. Okay. okay, so that's it. So, uh, Professor Targan, uh, shall we wind up the program? Let, let, let me say a word of word more. Uh, I mean, uh, once again, we all wish to thank uh, Professor Vedu Rajamani uh, for his kindness and also the uh, extremely. Sorry, you're muted, Professor Targan. Uh, okay, I, I, I hope I am I'm, I'm being heard. Oh, you've yeah. been here. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I wish to thank you uh, for, you know, first of all, it's a kind of a subject on which it's very difficult to, to, to present one lecture alone. I mean, you know, when you do a uh, lecture on this kind of a subject, you can be led to other areas of interest and with a multiple number of people sitting around with around with a lot of interest there could be questions which will lead you away from the main topic as you and in a in a way i felt that uh, you you missed out uh, not only uh, i'm sure that you deliberately missed out one very important point of water management which of course was of great interest to to kerala and uh, you know, and of course, on that you have already written a, a, a book in, book in my <laughs> that we'll discuss separately sometime. Back. Anyway, you have been very kind, and I, I I wish to thank you on behalf of the KCHR. Uh, I should also apologize on behalf of Professor Adrinima, who is our director. Uh, she could not attend only because uh, we were involved in an important meeting. And she had to write its minutes straight away. I mean, so she couldn't uh, postpone it. 
Um, she's still at it. Uh, that's only so she wanted me to convey to you her uh, uh, apologies. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'm sure that she would have been there. Uh, so once again, thank you. Thank you very much.